where do we go to get that energy we need and that fo- to, to keep our focus and to keep our drive? Whenever you're moving from one level to the other and you have to reinvent yourself, the adjustment, it's very, very difficult. It's very, very challenging. And I think that you need to begin to remind yourself of your why. You know, Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, if you know why you're doing something, it will empower you to endure anything that you're going through. When you're working in corporations, you're working in financial services, it's a very competitive area. It's very, very dynamic. It's, this is the era that Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. And so people are tensed and, and very, very stressed out. So how do you deal with that? And, and knowing why you do what it is that you do. The name of the game right now is perceptual and psychological. It's the mental adjustments that we must make in the midst of the difficulties. That's what leaders do. Leaders don't panic. They are not intimidated by the change. They're not intimidated by the difficulties. What they are, they are empowered by it. I remember reading something that said, says not what you don't have is what you think you need that keeps you from handling the difficulties and the challenges of life. That we have everything we need within us to face and to deal with whatever we have at, at, at hand because we are more powerful than anything that we're up against. Now, these mental adjustments and this, uh, this idea that I've got what I need, I mean, in some ways, that represents who I am. For many years, I was living a life that I was not designed to do. I'm designed to speak. That's what I do. But for 42 years, I'm 62 now, for 42 years, I was doing something I wasn't designed to do because when I looked at what I wanted to do, that was to speak, to train, to empower people, that my inner conversation to myself was, Les Brown, you can't do that. You were labeled educable mental retarded in the fifth grade. You have no college training. You were born in an abandoned building on a floor. You don't even know your birth parents. You can't do that. You are DT. You were called the dumb twin. Those words became my reality for many years. And then someone came along and interrupted that conversation in my head and said, Mr. Brown, they tell me about to drop out of school. And and I said, "Um, well, yes, why, I, I, I just... I can't, I'm not smart like my brother. And I'll never forget when we first met, I was in his class waiting on another student. And he came in and said, young man, go to his board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter. Follow my directions anyhow. And I said, I can't, sir. And he said, why? I said, sir, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. So now this man changed how I saw myself. When I saw myself as the dumb twin, And that was the conversation in my head. That was given to me. That's what I believed. I accepted that. So the things that I was up against academically, they began to appear not as difficult as I thought they were because now he empowered me. Before then, right before then, up to that point, the things that were placed before me, I would stumble. I would slow the class down because I was convinced that I was dumb. I believe what they said to me. And this guy came along and he changed my perception of myself. Someone said that people don't live life as it is. They live life as they are. And so what we have to do as leaders, I don't care where you are in customer service, managing people, that you have to do during the tough times, you have to bring the best out of yourself. So it's right now. It's at this time of the struggle. We go through a restructuring. We have competition that's doing weird stuff out in the market. Um, and, and what you're saying is it, it's right now that tests my metal that, that builds me as a leader. Yes, uh, without any question, the sign that I saw the other day that said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. <laughs> Keep moving. You know, you got to continue to move. And if you continue to move and make the adjustments and fine tune your strategy and, and let the people on the organization know, hey, look here, we're going to make this happen. And here's what they have to do. They have to come from a place of it's possible. And once people begin to know that it's possible, then they begin to work within that framework. Sometimes we have to be intelligently ignorant. Many people fail to achieve the goals that they're capable of doing because they judge according to appearances. They know too much and they think themselves out of it. What we have to do in this point in time, in this period of our history, is begin to be open to the possibility that it's possible, that we can do this. And the next step is that it's necessary. 
it's necessary that we find a way to make this work, that we look for ways to optimize the efficiency of our operation. It's necessary that everybody gets on the same page. It's necessary that we develop one vision, one voice, and higher standards on how we're going to begin to drive the culture to impact our bottom line, to begin to take the level of customer service that we envision to another level to dominate the marketplace. It's necessary. Being second place is not name of the game. That's not acceptable. We've got to make it happen. And that it's you and it's me. All of us must take ownership for it. It was George Bernard Shaw who said the people that make it in life, they look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. That's what leaders do. And how do I take that that picture that I have and get my employees to really see the possibility as well? Speed of the leader, speed of the group. You have got to buy into it. You've got to believe it. The difference between leaders and, and, and people that are followers. Leaders, it, it, it's, a, it's a whole different standard for them. You know, they, it's a difference between being in the business and the business being in you. That it has to be who you are and that you set the pace for the organization. If the leader becomes cynical, if there's any doubt, if you don't have absolute faith that you can make it happen, if you become cynical, if they sense that you don't believe that it can happen, if you start complaining about the fact that you can't get your higher-ups to answer or there's so much political bureaucracy that we have to deal with, that you're frustrated, that you don't know what to do, that you're pulling your hair out, that you can't sleep at night because of the fact that it's out of your control. If you have that victim mindset and feeling powerless, that nonverbal communication your facial expression, your energy, the spirit of who you are, that will permeate and contaminate the spirit of the organization. Many leaders, their effectiveness with their people, their impact, their influence begins to diminish because they don't take the time to shop in their minds, to build their faith, to build their skills, to empower and increase their confidence in themselves. So part of what we have to do, all leaders, you have to take time to pour into yourself and you've got to also reach out. You've got to have a board of advisors and, and it's your support committee that will give you a home court advantage. More teams win on at home than they do on the road. 87% why? Because they have people cheering for them. I think that all leaders should have people around them, their group, their mastermind group that will help to pour into them. There's safety in counsel that they can talk to. One of the things I always tell leaders that ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. What do I do if, if I'm just not interested in playing this game? You know, it's easier, maybe I'll just coast it out. You know, some of us have been had our careers for a long time. Yes. Can't I just mark time until this passes or, you know, until something you, new you, you comes along? You can do that. You, you, can, you can become a volunteer victim and choose to play your life out like that. What if you live your whole life only to discover that it was wrong? That you just showed up, they paid you just enough to keep you from quitting, and you worked just hard enough to keep from getting fired. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine say to me, I was in radio at that point in time working for Skyway Broadcasting Company in Columbus, Ohio, and this guy named Horace Perkins, he was the head of sales, he said, Les Brown, you are sorry. I said, what do you mean, man? You know, I'm sorry. I'm the number one personality in the morning here in Columbus. What do you mean? He said, it's still not enough. You can do better than that, man. Your, your abilities, your talents go beyond this microphone. You can do more than that. You're more than just a disc jockey. I said, well, how do, how do I do that? He says, never ask how. Just make your commitment that you're going to develop yourself, man. He said, live full less and die empty. Wow, that grabbed me. I did not know at that point in time, I just saw myself as a disc jockey. He challenged me. You know, Robert Shula said, you either expand or you are expendable. Today, you've got to be flexible. You've got to be adaptable. You've got to be versatile. And you've got to take responsibility for your own education, for taking control of your own career and advancing yourself taking responsibility for your life. You're not doing it for the corporation. You're not doing it for your supervisor. You're giving your best at all times, under all circumstances, because that's who you are. I think there's a principle there that uh, sometimes it's just my sheer commitment and willingness to keep hammering away at, uh, at what I know needs to be done. I'll never forget, Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, I said, yes, sir. He said, what do you want to do with your life, young man? I said, I want to take care of my mother, sir. 
My mother's a domestic worker in Miami Beach. You know, we used to eat the food left over at Todd from the families that Obama cooked for. They would say, Mamie, whatever food is left over, you've adopted these seven kids. Mama was 46 out of third grade education. They said, you can pack it up and take it home and, and feed those children that you have adopted. And had they not done that, many nights we would have gone to bed hungry. And wow, I admire this woman. Saw her on knees scrubbing floors and cleaning toilets to take care of us. And looking at her example and her, her relentlessness and her unstoppable spirit, she didn't let anything stop her. And as we begin to look at ourselves and, and look at our lives and look at where we are, one of the things that I know that we can do more than we can ever begin to imagine. But many times we have to begin to look at ourselves and realize that who we've been up to this point has not cut it. And we've got to begin to challenge ourselves to dig deeper. Einstein said the thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. And as leaders, we have to begin to look at ourselves and we have to be the message that we bring. And if we want to produce greater results out of our people and where we are, we've got to radically change who we are. And I'll tell anybody listening to us right now, what is it about you that you know that one thing, that if you radically change that one thing, it will change your leadership. It will spark a, a, a new level of inspiration and the people that you're working with and take them to another level. What is that one thing? And once we do that, it's un, unlimited of what we can do because if you're persistent and keep coming back again and again and again, even a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> now, isn't it true, though, that, that when it comes down to that one thing, uh, I'm pretty comfortable with my faults. Uh, I, I've got my stories that I tell. I've got the way that I justify the fact that I behave. You know, that's just me. It's just yeah. the way it is. You need to adjust because, you know, that's just how I am. Um, you know, that's a challenge to say change. Well, that's, that's, not, that's not the way we are. See, we're all born the same way. We're all born dumb, naked, and speechless. And no one comes here knowing anything. A tree can't be anything but a tree. But the greatest power that we have as human beings, we have the power to change. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve, the mediocre part of you or the greatness that you have within you. Challenge yourself. I can come out of a program like this or some sort of a reflection and decide, okay, I can make a little change. There's a, there's a change that I feel I can make. Um, but I just don't see, I mean, I, I don't know that I can change all of these aspects of how I operate and how I lead. I think that what you said is, is crucial right here. You said, I don't know if I can do that. When I looked at the goals that I wanted to achieve, my heart said I can do that. If you ask most people, if you had your life to live over again, do you believe that you could do more than what you've done? If most people are honest, they will raise their hands and say yes. Then why is it that we don't do this? And the way that we ever do anything is we first make the commitment to do it. That's what we do. John F. Kennedy, he said we're going to the moon. He wasn't a scientist. The technology was not around then. He said, in 10 years, we're going to the moon. He made a commitment. He spoke it into existence. In the beginning, was the word? He said, we're going to the moon. We're going to make this happen. That was a commitment of this country. We're going to the moon. We will get there before the Russians. And there was a collective buy-in that everybody bought into it. Nobody questioned it because he said it with absolute faith. And everybody got on the page and began to look for ways of how we're going to make this happen. But what most people do is they go to, I don't know how to do it. They go to, how do we do it? Asking those questions. No, make the commitment. Once you make the commitment, the how, the way, the resources, the ideas, everything you need to make it happen will begin to show up and reveal itself. Once I realize that I've got the ability and I've got it in me in my own unique you know, sort of way, how do I achieve my potential? How, what's the next step for me as a leader? Many talented and gifted leaders go on unnoticed and the world never had a chance to hear from them because they allow themselves to become negative. They allow themselves to become volunteer victims. They allow themselves to focus on the problem rather than the possibilities. Jim Rohn said, when the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. You've got to continue to stretch continue to grow, continue to expand. Socrates says a man's reach is to supersede his grasp. Well, what are the heavens for? We have far more in ourselves, but we've got to challenge ourselves. We have to engage in that process. Most people just park. They go so far and they park and they coast out to the sunset. Who you are as a person comes out and shows up in your leadership. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's about personal empowerment, 
becoming aware of who you are, self-awareness, and what is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you? What is it that you want? Is cultivating a sense of goodness and greatness within yourself and working on yourself and saying to yourself, I deserve this. I deserve this standard of greatness from myself and pushing yourself. And the next level, as you engage in that process, comes a commitment of how you manage yourself, your times, your skills, your talents, your abilities, how you work with others. As you gain greater insight into yourself, you gain greater insight into others. And out of that comes some achievements that you can point to. And then that brings you to self-fulfillment. How do we get here? What worked? What did not work? Now let's go back to the process all over again. It's a continuous, ongoing process. That's why Robert Shula said, success is never ending. We can always better our best. But to better our best, we have to learn and, and reflect on what's occurred up to now. Absolutely, and push ourselves and challenge ourselves and be self-motivated and continue to roll, raise the bar on ourselves and have some strategic partners that will hold us accountable for a higher standard. You can run faster with a, with a, a hundred who want to go than with one around your neck. You've got to evaluate the relationships that you have around you and ask yourself the question, what is this relationship doing to me? Am I growing? Am I developing? Is it stretching me? If you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So you've got to have people around you that you can learn from and that you can grow from. What would you leave us with? What do you want us to remember uh, in this opportunity? What contribution are you going to make to us in our thinking uh, to, to make this whole initiative and our role as leaders successful? Continue to raise the bar on yourself and understand and know that there's more in you to express, to do, than you can ever begin to imagine. It, it, Henry David Thoreau talked about that when you're moving in the direction of your dream, you will have some uncommon hours, some magical moments. There are moments when you say, wow, I can't believe that it's me. But you also go through this period, what, what Joseph Campbell called the long, dark journey of the soul. Life will catch you on the blind side. You will say, why did this have to happen to me? Why not you? Who would you suggest? It's called life. And so what we have to do is buckle in and we have to deal with it. We have to suck it up. It's not personal. It's called life. What did Forrest Gump said? Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. He was right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Les, I really appreciate this time. Again, thank you so much. Thank for you. I appreciate you for the opportunity. Yeah.